Nassim Taleb is one of the most influential and misunderstood thinkers of our era. A brilliant author who is not your typical slick, polished, well-spoken intellectual. I derive a huge amount of pleasure yes. from Twitter fights. Yes. What sets him apart is that he was a risk taker and made a fortune trade in before writing his books. A lot of people have mixed feelings about him and his attitude. So removing economists from the planet would improve the planet, okay? But personally, his uncompromising behavior signals values that resonate with me, freedom and courage. But most importantly, studying his books completely changed my outlook on life in a very short time. And in this video, I want to dive deep into the 10 rules of thumb that I learned from Nassim Taleb, which improved my decision-making ability, helped me increase my odds of success in my field, and that will help you avoid ruining your life. Now, before I start, understand that I cannot summarize in the same Taleb's books. He'll probably block me on Twitter if I try to. I do not read his books. I study them. I've read all of them at least three times. And every time I reread his books, I pick up on something I couldn't understand on the previous read. And these heuristics I'm gonna share with you really helped me navigate life as a manager, a creative, and a human being. The first book I picked up by Nassim Taleb was Anti-Fragile, and I was probably 21 years old, uh, the first time I've read it. Probably too young to understand a lot of the concepts on the book, but my main motive was to understand the word better. Even though I lacked the real life experience to help me absorb the nuances of the book, the overall concept of anti-fragility made sense immediately. And that's the first rule of thumb that stuck with me. Seek external stressors. Antifragility is a concept that anyone who ever built muscles will understand intuitively. Basically, Nassim Taleb explains that there are three different types of organisms or systems. First, the fragile, which does not benefit from external stress at all. Think of a glass that can break from the smallest external shock. Second, the robust, which does not easily get harmed nor benefit from external shock. And third is the anti-fragile, which benefits from external stress up to a point. Think of a muscle that grows bigger and stronger the heavier you lift. We humans are anti-fragile as individuals, as in what doesn't kill me makes me stronger, and as a species, as in what can kill me makes others stronger. Businesses thrive because of the failure rate is converted into benefits for the system. What kills me makes others stronger. The problem is our modern era made it that we're so sheltered from external stressors that we atrophy physically, mentally, and spiritually. Instead of building mental fortitude by taking certain type of risks, we've become so fragile, risk averse, and to be honest, domesticated. So after reading the book three times, I conditioned myself to seek anti-fragility everywhere. Whether it's moving to a new country where I didn't know anyone or exposing myself regularly to situations where I'm uncomfortable, like speaking in front of other people or approaching a girl I like. All of these small risks made me more robust. But another way to build mental fortitude that I learned from Nassim Taleb is to dive into ancient and classical wisdom, which brings me to the second heuristic, the Lindy effect. Back in the 1960s, comedians in New York City used to gather in the Lindy Delicatessen in Broadway to discuss show business. And they observed something fascinating. They discovered that a play that had been around for 200 days had an extra 200 days of life expectancy. And, and a thousand days, thousand more days. It became known as the Lindy effect. But this is not only limited to Broadway shows. It's applicable to all non-perishable items. In contrast to perishable items, like human beings, the life expectancy of books, ideas, religions, concepts increases the longer they exist. A book that survived for 40 years has a high chance to still be around for another 40 years. So how is this Lindy Law useful? Well, personally, it helped me filter through ideas, books, technologies, and even diets. Every day, there is some hot new thing, a new technology, a new study being sold to us that presumably fasting is unhealthy or that eggs will kill you, then you realize that these are things that stood the test of time. For example, I just finished a month of fasting for Ramadan. Fasting has been around for millennia. If it was really unhealthy, we'll know it by now. The health and spiritual benefits I got from it are intangible. And another way I implemented Lindy in my life is to read more old books that survived for centuries or millennia instead of the latest crisp looking New York Times bestseller. And the third heuristic is flaneurin, 
You see, Nassim Taleb even changed the way I travel. I'm currently in Geneva, Switzerland, and if there's something I agree on completely with Nassim Taleb is the sad phenomenon of the touristification of travel. I can't hide the scorn I have for people who travel with every day planned to the precise sign, leaving no room for randomness and uncertainty. And I think you gotta be a little bit dead inside to live that way. The flaneur, on the other hand, is the reverse tourist, basically wandering around aimlessly. And it just makes the whole experience thrilling. And flaneuring is not limited to travel alone. Nassim Taleb talks about flaneuring across disciplines and how he approached his own career and explains how school is the touristification of knowledge, basically. And to be honest, school made me hate reading books for a long time until I discovered that I only hated being told what to read. So instead now, I just follow my genuine curiosity and flaneur around disciplines but I'm not saying you should not develop a strong expertise to offer to the world I mean we still have to pay rent and earn a living which brings me to the fourth year sick the barbell strategy one of the most helpful concepts that I learned from Nassim Taleb's book the black swan is the barbell strategy he talks about it mainly in investment strategy but to be honest, it's applicable in life in general. And the goal of the strategy is to have a mix of extremely risky and extremely safe investments. That helps you balance the risk. In my case, for example, I want to build a YouTube channel. So I needed to build my skill set in videography, editing, and storytelling. We all know YouTube is a risky career path. It's a lot of uncertainty and most YouTubers never make it. So to avoid ruining my life, I needed a stable income from a lucrative career that will help me earn a living and invest some of the money into my skill set and gear. So I picked tech sales as a profession. A lot of people can just quit their job put all their eggs in one basket and start a business. And a few of them succeed, but a lot more fail. Because of the survivorship bias, we cannot read about the ones who fail. And in my opinion, the best way to leverage the barbell strategy is to have a stable income on the side, ideally from a profession where you can learn skills that will help you afterwards in your entrepreneurial venture or a creative business, while you're pursuing your creative projects on the side with no financial stress. Then you can go really aggressively with whatever savings you're willing to invest in your venture. Personally, I invest a lot in filmmaking courses, in gear, in travel to film content without ruining my life. And because I don't need to generate an income from YouTube, it doesn't compromise my art and I can be as authentic and uncompromising as I want here. Which brings me to the fifth heuristic, F.U. money. There is a story that I love that Nassim Taleb shares from Aristotle's book, Politics. It's about the great Greek philosopher Thales. Basically, Thales was criticized and mocked by his peers who were merchants back in ancient Greece. He told him that philosophy amounted to nothing since it was broke. That didn't sit well with Thales at all. So he decided to leverage a skill he had to prove them wrong. By using his skill in astronomy, he predicted that there will be great harvest for olives in the coming year. He put the little money he had as deposit for the use of olive presses during harvest. And when harvest time came, the demand for olive presses surged through the roof. And Thales basically let them out at whatever price he wanted and he made a fortune. And he proved to his peers that philosophers can easily be rich if they want it, but their ambition lies elsewhere. That's the ancient version of a few money. Now, to be honest, the same can be told for Nassim Taleb's career. I was in business school. I accidentally discovered probability theory and became obsessed with it. A friend told me about complex derivatives and I decided to make a career in them. This discovery allowed me to achieve financial independence in my 20s after the crash of 1987. Having a few money basically gives you options. An option to pursue what you really want to pursue, being uncompromising in your craft, and not taking shit from people who want to use their leverage on you. I didn't pick trading personally, but sales was the closest thing to help me generate the income that will help me buy my freedom in the future. The sixth heuristic is surgeons should not look like surgeons. Okay, imagine this. God forbid you have to undergo a high risk brain surgery next week. You're at the hospital and they give you the choice between two neurosurgeons. Both have the same track record, same credentials, and same experience. The first surgeon looks like he was out of Grey's Anatomy. Slick silver hair, well-mannered, he looks the part. The second one 
looks more like a butcher. Short and overweight, speaks with no filter with a strong New York accent, and even has a gold tooth and does not seem to care at all about his appearance. Well, the first time I personally went through this mental exercise, I picked the first one. Seemed like the safest option. But if we really want to avoid being suckers, as Nassim would say, we need to pick the second one. But this person had to overcome because not, it's not judged at all by anything external. It's judged entirely by the track record, you see, by the performance. You have to overcome all this perception bias to get there. So this is it. When a field that has skin in the game, the cosmetic, beware of the cosmetic. The one who does not look the part and is successful in his field had to overcome much more obstacles in terms of perception. He succeeded in spite of his looks. Seven, not all success is positive. After reading Fooled by Randomness, it completely changed my definition of success. I used to admire a lot of successful people who took tremendous risks. You know, the ones who were on the brink of bankruptcy but made it work at the end. I used to overlook ordinary successful people. A lot of them were close to me and they made a ton of money in a slow, steady way. They had control over their lives and they were not flashy at all. And I realized that a lot of successful people just took really stupid risks and got away with it. You can find a thousand other people who used the same strategy as these successful people but failed completely. But they're not the ones writing books and giving conferences. Eight, bottom up versus a top down approach. Throughout the inserto, uh, Nassim Taleb emphasized the superiority of a bottom up approach versus a top down approach. The more skin in the game someone has, not only in terms of incentives, but also disincentives. As in, if they make a decision and they're wrong, they pay the price for it, the better the outcome. Nassim emphasizes how tinkerers, engineers, entrepreneurs contributed a lot more to society than academics. Most discoveries, inventions, technological advancements came from tinkering and actually having skin in the game in the process, not through theory. I'm currently in the most bottom-up governed country probably in the world, Switzerland. In contrast to France, Switzerland is extremely decentralized. It's a direct democracy, so people and the canton govern themselves. I was surprised to see how much power the actual municipality has here. It really set the rules for each town. And if you don't respect the rules, you get fined and you actually pay for it. And Switzerland is one of the cleanest, safest, well-governed countries in the world. And it's a great example of how having skin in the game lead to better outcomes. Nine is the anti-library. Nassim is really good at coming up with witty notions like this. What he means by the anti-library is the pile of books you have that you still didn't read yet. I always felt bad when I had a pile of books that I didn't read yet. And I always praised myself on having read all the books on my bookshelf. But the reality is the more books you read, the more books you buy. The more you read, the more your curiosity grows because you realize how much you don't know. So having an anti library, a shelf or a pile of books that you didn't read yet, and investing in growing your anti-library is a really good idea. It's a constant reminder that you still don't know a lot about the world. So this year, instead of feeling bad about the pile of unread books I had, I doubled down on it and I started growing my anti-library. And the last heuristic is building a simple life is hard. In his commencement speech at the American University of Beirut, Nassim Taleb mentioned that when he made a lot of money, he realized that he didn't like a lot of the sophistication that came with being rich. I discovered that I hated fame. I hated famous people. I hated caviar. I hated champagne, complicated food, expensive wine, and mostly people who comment on wine. Instead of having my preferences dictated by norms that of magazines for rich people. Rich people can be the easiest praise for marketers and salespeople. And marketers are really good at playing on mimesis. This contagion between people. We want what others want and it creates this competition between them. And the easiest thing that can happen when becoming rich is to have a very sophisticated lifestyle. But what's really hard is questioning our desires, uncovering our real thick desires and real tastes, instead of blindly following what corporate advertising dictate to us. And that's something I really think about now. Spending the time to think about our deep desires and uncovering them is really hard. That's why in May, I'm secluding myself in Norway for a few days to really think about my deep, and thick desires. And I'll keep you posted on how the exercise goes. Don't forget to subscribe and like, and I'll see you in the next video.